Immediately, he's one of ours, Mohamed Nanave, who is the head of online at Al Jazeera, and also uh, created the new media departments, so are really responsible in a way for everything we're seeing um, today. Uh, just quickly, the point which uh, MJ was making earlier about Al Jazeera not necessarily being available uh, to everyone, that's something which we've obviously realized, and it's thanks to people like Mohammed and our online team who've created such a huge online presence for Al Jazeera, uh, aljazeera.net forward slash English, by the way. Um, which means we can get out there and people know who we are. Mohammed. Thank you. You know, my t the topic of the, schedule, of the discussion they gave me originally was the Al Jazeera model. Uh, and I thought I can just come up and say whatever he said. Um, because pretty much that's sort of uh, the culture that we're trying to infuse at Al Jazeera. That um, when we look at media, when we look at the internet, when we look at content, um, we really want to build an open uh, environment and an open, open ecosystem. So everything we've been doing over the last couple of years has been trying to promote openness and trying to figure out how do big media companies such as, our, such as ourselves fit into this ecosystem. Um, so I'm not going to jump straight into that because Joy's talked about it and everybody's talked about it. I just want to talk a bit about um, news on the internet and, you know, and start of just looking at how do we talk about news um, and how has news changed now that we have to deal with this online world where everybody can talk and write and blog and post videos. Um, so there's this famous quote from uh, a famous journalist, C.P. Scott, um, where he said, facts are sacred, but comment is free. Um, and this later became the title of the Guardian's uh, famous section, Comment is Free, which uh, is the opinion and analysis section. Um, and, you know, this is sort of the idea of what facts are and what are facts and how do we choose facts, which is really goes to the heart of journalism and what we do and what we report. Because um, trying to understand what those facts are, how we use them, how we place them, is really the business that we're in. But whenever I see this quote, and whenever I go to the Guardian's website, I'm always reminded about uh, something that E.H. Carr wrote in response to this. Um, and he says, this clearly will not do. Um, and I think this is fundamental to the understanding of our profession and how we do journalism and how we conceptualize the work that we do. Because facts themselves are empty. You know, facts are things that can be used. There's, n you know, we don't find these facts that we look at as journalists in the natural world. You know, they don't exist independently um, of us. So E.H. Carr went on, you know, uh, and this was in his famous uh, lecture on what is history at Cambridge, where he's talking about how historians look at fact. And it's, you know, very similar to how we as journalists look at facts. And, you know, the facts that we choose, the how we place those facts, the priority we give them, the ones that we leave out, these all constitute the message. And these in themselves, this choice, um, is not something that we do independently. So there's no independent objective story that anybody would write or anybody could write. It can't exist. The mere choice that we've made to report that story or not report that story is a choice. Um, so the question that we now have is, you know, and, and this is, you know, has been going on within our profession, you know, as the internet has come on and everyone, you know, these bloggers are coming on, and the first thing a journalist turns around into, he says, well, they're not objective. You know, there's all this commentary going on and it's opinion and so on, and it's not accurate. And of course, you know, and somehow journalists need to take the, you know, the high ground and start talking about how, you know, we are accurate and, you know, objective and so on. Um, but as Hausman points out, accuracy is a duty. It's not a virtue as a journalist. It's not something that you've done extra. It's not something beyond your job. It's a basic requirement in the same way that an architect would need to ensure that the cement was chosen properly so the house would stand. It's not something that we do beyond uh, our role. So then the question, uh, you know, we need to look at is news and how do we constitute news? And especially in this online world, previously, 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, when news and news production wasn't, sorry, can everyone hear me fine now? So, you know, news production was very controlled, very regulated. It was the broadcaster, it was a couple of newspapers who would decide what would be in the news today, what would be on the news agenda tomorrow. Um, and, you know, if we look at the role the internet has had over the last 10 years, that's begun to change. And now, you know, there's many more voices being able to try to drive the news agenda, change the news agenda. MJ, you know, made this point about looking at the coverage of Israel in the U.S. Um, and Professor John Mearsheimer recently said this two weeks ago in a speech in D.C. where he said, you know, for the conflict, the internet's a game changer. Just because the, the number of voices that you have um, in these conflicts um, that are ideological, are important. So when we look at news and how we conceptualize the news, we need to ask ourselves what impact is the internet having? Because apart from all the great tools and technologies 
and iPhones and iPads and all the rest of it that we can have and that we can push our content out on and we can collect content from. The real issue is really how does it change the content itself? How does it change the messaging? How does it change the way we choose our news and what news we choose and what news we report? So, you know, if you, if you look at a bit back at how, you know, issues... Um, how do what I mean fundamentally how what's the news story you know why is something news and you know I'm sure lots of lots of theories been written on why something news why we choose a story what's important you know and so on but fundamentally news is something that we it's news because we've said it's news and that's fundamentally what a news story is because we as Al Jazeera or the BBC or Reuters have decided that something would be a news story that's why it's become a news story it's a negotiation that we have in our newsrooms, and it's a negotiation that we have with the public. And if the public accepts from us that we've said this is news, then it becomes news. And, it's now, and, and that's now spread out, and it goes out, and it's broadcast, and it's rebroadcast, um, and moves on. And you know, this in, cell in itself has been noted over and over is, is quite dangerous, and it's you know, quite a responsibility as journalists that we have, because we're making those choices, and we're making those choices on behalf of our publics. Um, and we don't make these choices, you know, outside of any, uh, there's no independent objective parameters. We do it. We do it, and we've all got experience, and it fills into that experience. So Robert Cox, um, when talking about theory, um, you know, wrote that theory is always for someone and some purpose. And the same way that news is for someone and some purpose. It doesn't exist independently. And the reason why I'm going through all this theory and talking about news and how we constitute news and how we choose news and so on, is because, you know, over the last 10 years, what we've seen um, in our industry has been the shift where we've started, you know, people have been looking out and saying, well, this has changed because, you know, now we have the internet and everybody has a voice. And the question now, you know, as we sit down um, 15, 20 years since the internet's been in play and everybody is now getting online and having access and writing blogs, we need to ask ourselves, has this actually changed? And has the power um, of deciding news, choosing news, writing news, and setting the news agenda actually moved, or has it not? So, um, you know, this is Rupert Murdoch, who some of you may know. And, you know, in 2006, Murdoch, you know, was quoted in Wired magazine, talking about this fundamental shift that he saw, and the shift that we've all been talking about, saying that, you know, the powers moved away from the printing press, uh, because, you know, uh, the birth of mass media, technologies shifting away from, our, from the editors, from us, from the publishers, and you know, the people are taking control. Um, and this was sort of this uh, very utopian view of what the internet was doing. You know, uh, we had this view, and we talk, you know, people on the internet will always talk about how information wants to be free. Um, and we had this utopia that you know, as the technology diffused, everybody would now have this voice, and we'd then be able to change the way we reported news, um, we'd ch be able to change the way our governments thought, and so on. Um, now, Rupert said this in 2006. He went out and bought MySpace, um, largely driven by this because now the people were taking over and they were all on MySpace. Four years later, um, I'm not sure if we've, if we've lived up to this expectation. You know, or is it just more of the same? Are we still in the same position where we were, where all these people have come online um, and we've not really seen a change and a shift in the news agenda? And, you know, what's interesting is, uh, you know, last year, and, you know, this is coming to effect this year, Rupert went on and saying, well, news is free on the web and that's got to change. Which is a very, uh, it's, it's, you know, if you, look, if you go back four years and look at what he said then, uh, that the people were taking over. And now going back to say, well, we'll put up this paywall and we'll still tell you what news is. Um, that's quite significant. And it's quite significant that what he's trying to do is going back and saying, well, the editors are taking over again. Um, now, of course, you know, you've heard our Director General make a couple of announcements today on this and about, you know, how we view openness and so on. So just to proceed, just as I've proceeded this discussion, looking at, you know, we need to understand what um, exactly our role is as journalists, as people working in the online space is in this new media environment, where all these other people now have, as have access and where we are sitting, still try controlling and we feel we have some control over this messaging and this news. Um, and I think it's still true. We still do have this control over this messaging. But as this ecosystem develops, um, and as it moves on, and you'll hear this in the next session um, with the guys from Twitter and Kevin Anderson um, speak about this, you know, how that conversation has shifted. So for us at Al Jazeera, you know, with this theoretical background now of how we choose our facts and how we look at news and, you know, what, 
um, news is for. And you know, uh, what Wada Khanfer talked about, you know, the mission uh, that Al Jazeera has and the spirit of Al Jazeera. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very emancipatory message um, that he was delivering, talking about the voice of the voiceless um, and so on. So where this leads us to uh, when we're looking at new media and looking at online and looking at technology, because if this is how we understand news and how we create news, um, it leads you online to a posture. And this posture is openness. And you know, Joy has just um, you know, given us a great overview of what that means. But this posture of openness for me has two elements. One is how we approach um, what material we use um, and how we approach uh, the people we were our audience and how we let them use our material. So, you know, there's this famous quote by Jeff Jarvis, um, who's a journalism professor at, uh, in New York, and he says, do what you do best and link to the rest. And I think this sort of sums up a lot of this discussion of openness, because as our industry, you know, is struggling and we've heard uh, Joshua talk about the newspaper revenues going down and everybody's struggling to find the business model, we can't do everything anymore. And previously, the posture that we would adopt as news organizations was that you know, you'd come to me, and I'd tell you everything there is. And I'd be the authoritative source on everything. And that's just not viable anymore as we move forward. You know, it's, you know, as people shut down their foreign bureaus, as they cut back, they, you know, they cut the fat. We can't afford the advertising market's gone, been shot. So you, know, you have to focus on what you do best. And then send out your audience to other news organizations who have that speciality. Um, and you know, this for, you know, people find this difficult. And you know, I have this discussion in my own news newsroom um, when we started talking about how we link out. And people are just scared. Well, how can we send the link to the New York Times? How could we send the link to, a link to the Huffington Post? Because you know, we, we're telling our audience that we don't have it all. And the reality is no one has it all. You know, because the internet's so wide that no one organization can have everything. Um, so, the only, so if you accept that your posture is openness, you accept as well that there are some things which your audience will come to you. And instead of you having everything and being the authoritative source from A to Z, what the audience now expects from you is not that you, you will have everything, but the audience expects from you is that you will be able to guide them to reliable information on the internet. So you do what you do best. We will have the best coverage of many things at Al Jazeera. Um, you know, you, it's, we'll have that, we've got a great correspondent network, we've got a great newsroom, fantastic journalists, and you're gonna find, you know, 90% of what you're looking for on the website. But there's, there's a 10% which is super specialized that we may not have. But instead of us leaving you, uh, leaving the audience without being able to find it, the correct thing to do is to guide the audience and say, hey, we don't have this, but go here and you'll find it. And our role then changes. So instead of just being the endpoint for them, we now become curators of content. And we help them navigate this internet. Because the internet's huge, it's vast, it's wide. There's information being created everywhere, all the time. So in order for us to really facilitate this and do our duty to the audience, um, we need to be able to say, well, look, you, know, you trust us, and that's why you've come to us. And what we'll do is we will gui guide you along this news landscape that's complicated and it's difficult, and it's, you know, there's all the stuff that goes along with the media landscape, and we'll help you find the best that out, that's out there. So the other part of this posture of openness is what uh, Joyce are talking about with Creative Commons. So I'm just gonna go a bit more into detail about why we've done this, because it sort of sets the stage for a lot of the other things that we've done at Al Jazeera. Um, so you know, this was our Creative Commons repository that we put up after the war in Gaza. Um, there's you know, some more footage inside and some more to come. Um, but what the Creative Commons repository allowed us to do was take our content and license it out to other news organizations, um, to documentary filmmakers. And that's when we started doing this, that's what we had in mind. We said, well, we've got this valuable footage um, and let's you know, let other people use it. Let's let other broadcasters take it and replay it, put it on air and let documentary filmmakers take it and you know, they'll do something interesting with it. And it was an experiment that we thought we'd try. Um, and what happened afterwards was, you know, it, it was something we never expected. You know, we had thought, Broadcasters, documentary filmmakers, and broadcasters used it, and documentary filmmakers used it as well. But there were all these other people who just used it. So within just a couple of hours of us putting this content up and making the announcement that this repository has gone live on the internet, the Wikipedia community grabbed the images out of uh, our video and started populating Wikipedia articles with this. So suddenly you had you know, this, this first draft of history being written by Wikipedia, the Wikipedia community. 
and s now they had material, they had you know images to you know to to enhance these articles. So you know these this video that we had put up was now suddenly within the within the public record and within the public mind, um, and it resides in Wikipedia and will continue to reside in Wikipedia. And if you think of Wikipedia, you know not just as this encyclopedia, but it's sort of this collective repository, um, you know of of everything that humanity is built. You know it's sort of our cultural. Uh, our culture being constituted and reconstituted all the time, and we're building it collectively, um, because fundamentally that's what a wiki is. So you know, now we've taken this content and it's diffused through there. So it'll be something that will be there when our kids and whoever else goes on to find out about some event, and they'll go up and look it up in Wikipedia, and now they'll find the images to go along with it. So that was quite important for us. Um, then we had filmmakers, music videos, artists, video games, you know, every form of media that you could think of use this footage. You know, we, I mean, when we started it, we had no idea. We really just thought it's going to be documentary filmmakers and it's going to be other broadcasters. But suddenly, you know, people were using it in schools, at universities, um, for public service announcements, and it just spread across the internet. And for us, it was quite powerful to understand that, you know, once you've taken away certain barriers to your media, you know, people will come and they'll do things which you never thought was possible. You know, and it wouldn't have been possible if you hadn't used it under these licenses. And, you know, we know, you know, being on the internet for the amount of time that we have, we've seen what's happened to the music industry um, and to the film industry and how content gets shifted around, um, often illegally. So it's going to happen. But as soon as you facilitate it and say, well, we'll remove some barriers and let's do this legally and see what happens, suddenly you see um, this creative expression fl flourish. So, you know, this is uh, the Wikipedia articles where it started going into. Um, so what this experience taught, taught us was a couple of things. So firstly, you know, we did this and, you know, it was really good for our reputation as Al Jazeera. Joy goes around the world now, you know, talking about us and the White House and how great we are, um, which is fantastic. But, you know, it's also good for us in terms of people in our industry look at Al Jazeera and say, well, this is the model that we can use. Uh, it enhanced our distribution. You know, uh, MJ spoke about us being available in America and people getting us on the internet. But what it did by putting this material and making it available, other broadcasters took it as part of the licensing agreement. Um, they would need to attribute it back to us. So it enhanced our distribution. We had broadcasters just taking it on um, and pushed our content out further. People who may have never seen Al Jazeera or thought to have switched, to, um, switched their remotes to Al Jazeera had their footage in front of them. Um, there are financial benefits out of this as well. So it's not just free and, you know, we give it away. People would then see this content and come back and say, well, you've given us this, but we also want this and this, and we'll pay for it because we're doing, uh, making a documentary. Um, it empowered the community, and this is something important, especially in this region. Um, there's lots of young filmmakers. They don't have access to content. It's very difficult to get started um, making a documentary, um, getting archival material. Um, so by giving back to this community of people, of journalists, of filmmakers, uh, we actually help them get started on this and hopefully produce the next generation of journalists um, and documentary filmmakers. Um, and part of it at the end is also just a bit about respecting our audience. You know, it's no longer, as we move into this online landscape, it's no longer that people just sit back and listen to us. You know, people sit forward and they choose to consume us online. You know, people are no longer just passive consumers of information. Um, they're creating their own information, they're blogging it, they're tweeting it, they're creating their own videos. And as this happens, you know, uh, it's no longer just us and them. So if you look at the Iran election and, you know, other examples of this where lots of the information was coming out of YouTube or Twitter and so on, if we as journalists are just taking this information and sucking it out, you know, we should have some sort of duty as well to be able to make our content available back to people. And not just saying, well, we'll take it, we'll take it, we'll take it. Um, we might credit you and put your name on TV, but that's it. Um, and finally, it was, you know, to challenge our competitors and challenge other broadcasters and other media companies to say, hey, we've done this. Here's a use case for it. It's been successful. You should try it. Um, so in the end, I think the most important part of it is, is, you know, as you put this out, we really what we're doing is constituting and reconstituting culture and knowledge. Um, and when I think of Creative Commons, you know, this is something I've been going around uh, telling people recently when I speak about Creative Commons is, you know, what we're doing is we're helping contaminate culture. Um, and I use contaminate not in the word, not in the way that's you know negative and you know we're taking something and you know making it dirty, but in the positive sense, you know that this is this is how culture diffuses and this is how culture gets built by contamination. The fact that um, you know if you look at this region in the Middle East, you know it's it's not a stagnant culture. It didn't just stay. People traveled through it as traders moved through. 
Um, that's how this culture was constituted. And the same for other parts of the world. You know, um, th this is how parts of southern Africa, um, you know, were, were populated by Bantu movement. People move. People interact. When cultures interact, that's how we constitute our culture. There's no such thing as a stagnant culture that, this, that, that sits independently of each other. So in the same way, when we make this media available and share it, we are constituting and reconstituting each other's cultures. And in this globalized world where everybody um, interacts with each other online at some level, even though we may never travel to other places, um, the act of you know, consuming this culture, sharing it and putting it out there uh, becomes important in how we live. Um, and finally, you know, so this is sort of what we've done with Creative Commons and this layer and this posture towards openness. But then this, this leads as well to many other things that we do. So if you look at what we've done, MJ spoke about uh, YouTube and how Al Jazeera content is available on YouTube. Because we've taken this open posture, um, we started our YouTube project at a time when other, news, um, other media organizations were all pulling their content off YouTube. Right? So you know, there was a time when everybody was um, sending takedown notices to YouTube saying, take it off, we don't want it there. Um, and th that time we said, hey, you know, this is important because YouTube's not something that's, you know, it's, it's, culturally, le it's culturally relevant. Um, and for us at Al Jazeera, what's our goal? Our goal is to be able to distribute our content as far as wide as possible to reach new audiences. So there's two things that would happen. One is these audiences, these young people are on YouTube. So by making our content available on YouTube, uh, we're reaching these new audiences. Many people who had never seen Al Jazeera would have seen it because, you know, a video got featured on the front page of YouTube or someone shared a link. But the second thing we did was by putting it up on YouTube, we empowered our audience to be able to evangelize and share our content for us. So it wasn't us who had to go out and do this distribution. Our audience went out and distributed our content for us. They would take it and embed it on their blogs, embed it on other websites, and share it further. Um, and this further spread our content um, around the internet into new audiences. And you know, there's definitely a percentage of those people who then you know, come into contact with Al Jazeera content. They may have never chosen to have done it, but because they've seen it on their friend's blog or through Facebook or wherever else, they may now stay on and become you know, a, uh, a, royal, a loyal reader or viewer of Al Jazeera. And this is important um, in this media landscape where, where it's so diverse you know, and you know, it's no longer my local newspaper and my local TV station, but we're competing in this global landscape. Um, thanks a lot. I'm sure we'll discuss this further. Do you have any questions?